after the issue of freebies, another big politics versus financial prudence debate has kick-started with many states predominantly Congress ruled going back to the old pension scheme that was changed in 2004. After Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh, Jharkhand and Punjab, now Himachal Pradesh has become another state that has decided to replace the national pension system with OPS. This was a poll promise of the newly elected Congress government, remember. This has raised alarm amongst many about the financial health of both the states and the country at large. In 30 years, primarily due to greater life expectancy, cumulative pension bill of states has jumped from 3,000 crores to nearly 4 lakh crores. Overall, pension payments by states eat away a quarter of their own tax revenues. For some states, it is much higher. Funding a small number of former government employees by utilizing a chunk of taxpayers' money is being objected to by experts and across the spectrum, mind you. And they warn that today's bad decisions will cost future generations dearly. In many states, the pension expenditure is even higher than salary spending for current employees. Now take a look at how bad the situation is already for states rolling back the NPS for Himachal Pradesh the percentage of pensions as state's own revenue is 80%. For Punjab, it is almost 35%. For Rajasthan, 30%. For Chhattisgarh, 24%. If you add wages and salaries of state government employees to this bill, states are left already with hardly anything from their own tax receipts. A quick reminder of the two systems and why the OPS is not considered financially viable. Now, the NPS is called the Defined Contribution Pension System, while the OPS is Defined Benefit Pension System. In NPS, the employer and the employee contribute to pension wealth payable at the time of retirement in way of annuity and lump sum. Now, under OPS, employees were not required to contribute to their pensions. The NPS allows withdrawal of 60% of corpus at the time of retirement tax-free under OPS upon retirement employees receive 50% of their last drawn basic pay plus DNS allowance or average earnings in the last 10 months as a pension. While in NPS, remaining amount is annuitized, which can provide a pension of about 35% of last drawn pay. Under OPS, pensions are also revised or increased as per pay commission recommendation, so the liability also keeps increasing even for those already retired. The big question today, with some states reverting to OPS and promises of the old pension scheme increasing by the day, are we not inviting a financial disaster? We have two experts joining us. Dheeraj Nair is former head economics, finance and commerce at the Niti Aayog, along with Jay Prakash Narayan, who's from the Lok Satta Party, founder of Foundation of Democratic Reforms and a former public servant himself. Let me begin with Jay Prakash Narayan first up. You feel very strongly about the revival of this old pension scheme in some states and you've been talking about this on your social media handle, for example. Now, the Congress government in Himachal Pradesh has already promised it. We've got governments in Rajasthan, Chhattisgarh uh, and uh, Punjab talking about it. We've got West Bengal that never even implemented the new pension scheme. What do you think are the dangers of going back to the pension, old pension scheme and why do you think this is such a wrong path for India? Let's take the facts, Shivani. When we became independent, our average lifespan was about 31, 32. Mm -hmm. A retired employee probably did not live much longer on an average. Today, our average lifespan is close to 70, and most of the employees, because these are from the higher classes, they probably, after retirement, there is a 30, 40 year lifespan. We have forgotten about it. Even in the old pension scheme, what is old pension scheme? It is nothing but what is called defined benefit scheme. Right. That means irrespective of what happens, irrespective of the money is there or not, you get a guaranteed amount. Mm. It's not merely a fixed amount. It's index linked. Mm. Therefore, there are people who retired at 10,000 rupees salary. They are now getting 50,000 rupees pension. Mm. One of the reasons why in defense forces we don't have money is one rank, one pension means most of the defense budget is going for pension. Because after 15 years service, you have 50 years, 60 years pension. Yeah. So what happens is with expanding age lifespan, the period to which they're entitled to pension keeps increasing. The second is India is about the only big economy, even in this old defined, defined pension, defined benefit scheme, never had any contributions for the employer employer. 
other countries actually collect from the employee mm -hmm. and put away some money from the employer. Even if that money is not enough, at least there's a significant amount of money in the kitty. Whereas in our country, what is happening is for the services rendered today, your generation, because you're much younger, you are going to pay tomorrow, 30 years later. It's absolutely unfair, fiscally disastrous and immoral because we don't burden our children. If at all you pay, you pay it now. Hmm. You put away the money for the pension today, either the government or the employee. So even the model, even the old pension scheme to which they are reverting, even that is bad by global standard. Hmm. Third is world of the given up old pension scheme, that kind of defined benefit scheme, way back in 1990s, we started later. We must be very grateful to Atul Bihari Vajpayee because he had the foresight, despite the government not being, you know, a government, uh, sing the single party, mm -hmm. he had the foresight and wisdom and he built consensus and all parties must complement them. Not only did he implement at the national level in 2003, 2004, except Bengal, as you said, every other state implemented it because they understood. They understood the realities of the situation. Numbers are clear. Now, let me quickly cite some of the numbers. Just nine years ago, Shivani, mm. the total state level, I'm not talking of union government, the state's pension burden was 1,45,000 crores. Last year, I don't have this year's numbers because there are some states don't have, they haven't given the numbers. Last year, 2021-22, it was 4,7,000 crores. In just nine years, the pension burden went up three times. Mm. And extrapolated to the future, what happens? Today, for instance, the pensions that are the own revenues of the states, that means the revenues that they're collecting from the state without money from the government of India, they constitute 30% of the total revenues. All the taxes and other fees that state governments collect, one third is already going for pensions alone. I'm not talking about salaries. Salaries, yes. Pensions alone. Now, what will happen? Even if you take government of India money, overall, if you take all the states, about 13 to 14 percent of the money is going towards pensions alone. Now, on the Pradesh government has done a lot of detailed calculation that gives you an indication across the country with some minor variations. You take the pension as a share of total revenue, that means including government of India's transfers. Today in the state is 11 percent. It will become 40 percent over time. Mm -hmm. By 2030, it will become 16%, 2040, 20%, 2050%, 29%. Remember, this is a total revenues, total revenues of the state, only pensions are taking away 30 or 40%, nothing left. I'm not talking of salaries. Yeah. And you add salaries burden to that, and then what happens is to fund this, the states will borrow more. And we already know, we've been discussing this in context of quote-unquote freebies, Mr. Narayan, what the debt ratio for many of these states already is. Now, already the states at 34, 35, some states at 43, 45, Punjab is at 58% yeah. of the GDP, whereas the norm is 20%. Already you've got three times. The borrowings will become three, four, five times this, not in mere absolute numbers as a ratio. Yeah. This is a looming disaster. This is a meteor, a massive meteor hitting us, except that in the case of a meteor, at this point in time, we can't do anything. This is in our hands. Not only are we not doing anything, we're actually destroying ourselves because Vajpayee government has done it. Hmm. All leaders across the country, all parties, wisely accepted, except in Bengal. Now, foolishly, we want to go back on that. There cannot be a greater disaster looming in this country, destroying our children's future. I'm saying this not with hyperbole. Hmm. I'm not prone to that. With absolute sincerity. Mr. Nair, I want to ask you, I mean, I just run the numbers for Himachal Pradesh, for example, that has become the latest state to want to go back to OPS. There, their percentage of, uh, you know, pensions to their revenues is already 80%. I'm, uh, you know, flabbergasted with this number already. How is a state like that going to be able to fund the old pension scheme and what is it going to do to its economy? The, the thing is that, you know, as... Mr. Narayan, as earlier said, the burden is not now. It will come, you know, 20, 30 years from now. So, I mean, it's easy for uh, today's uh, 
leaders to you know take this step because they know they don't have to pay for it today hmm. we paid for it a future date because you know even if you remember uh when this when we graduated from the old pension scheme to the new pension scheme during the Vajpayee government in early 2004 hmm. all those who had joined government service before 1st January 2004 remained on the old pension scheme yes it was only those who joined after 1st January 2004 who were, uh, graduated to the new pension scheme you know that was done to reduce the resistance and to get the reform done hmm. well, uh, uh, you know that what you call grandfathering of the existing people happened hmm. uh, and the new people were the ones subjected to it right so uh again you know now this old the old pension scheme will pre- presumably uh start and again in particular states including Himachal to people joining government service now so the burden will come later hmm. but the fact is that you know uh the points that mr narayan made that you know populations are, are uh, uh, life expectancy is growing uh the burden is bound to grow and you know the at the end of the day there's only so much fiscal space the center has the states have you either spend it on salaries pensions uh interest payments hmm. because you'll have to borrow to fund all of this hmm. or you can spend on roads schools uh sanitation drinking water so that that's the stark choice what you're ending up doing now is what I call subsidizing or, you know, giving a freebie to the labor elite because that's really what government employees are. They are the labor elite. Hmm. 80, 90% of the workforce in this country is in the unorganized sector. Exactly. Uh, forget pension. They don't even have you know, any kind of benefits while they work. So I think it's, you know, catering to a very small minority, an important minority, no doubt. They're influential voice. Hmm. But, uh, you know, at a considerable cost, not only for future generations, uh, but, you know, at a considerable cost also, uh, as you've already said, you know, if 80% of your revenue goes to pensions or, or pensions and salaries, then there's not very much left to spend on, you know, the rest of the population. Mr. You're spending only on your government employees. So I think in that sense, uh, it's completely uh, ignoring the majority and, you know, pan- pandering to, you know, vested interests. It's the kind of fee we, you know, you cannot say it's for deserving because government people are well paid. Uh, they have secure jobs for life, which mm. nobody in the private sector has. You and I don't have. Mm. Uh, so government comes with, anyway, government employment comes with a lot of benefits. And I think this additional freebie, it's not affordable. It's not productive. Uh, it's not to the deserving. So on no criteria. I mean, some Does freebies you may say if it's feeding poor, even if it's not productive, it's worth doing. But this is not that kind of uh, So Mr. Nair, spending. I want so to understand, I want to understand from you. Avoided. I want to understand from you, you know, nearly 20 years after this reform was pushed through, where, why do you think there's been such a hankering for, uh, to go back? Where, this, where is this coming from? When we all well, I mean, a- accepted and agreed that we needed to move on and the entire world has moved on. Yeah, but you see, populism never goes away. It hmm. keeps coming back in different forms. You know, we've done many hard reforms including this pension scheme, we've done the hard-fought reform of removing fuel subsidies and moving to, you know, market prices for for fuel. So, you know, there are a lot of reforms uh, which have done, but nothing is irreversible because, you know, influential vested interests, influential interests who have a voice will continue to demand, you know, it's good for them, uh, but it's not good for the rest of the people and it's not good for the economy. So I think it's, you know, mature polities uh, don't go back on reform. You know, we can say, you know, you can argue about what to do next in terms of reform, but yeah. you should never have an argument on going back on something which was done 18, 20 years ago and which was accepted across the board then. So okay. it's a dangerous trend because, you know, this can open the door for a whole lot of re- other reversals, including, you know, other kinds of wasteful subsidies, which, you know, it was a hard fought battle to get rid of them. Now, you know, once old pension scheme is back, uh, the next vested interest will try and bat for their own uh, subsidies to come back or own defined benefits of different yeah. kinds to come you know, back. I'm gonna, which will be damaging to the future of this country. So you're I'm basically, gonna come back to again, you populism, to understand, as you said, I mean, before no, every election, I'm going to understand to from you in right. just a bit of what we can do to, let's say, reduce this uh, uh, clamor. But I'm just going to come back to you. But I want to pose the same question to Mr. Narayan also. What do you think is the basic reason why suddenly... After agreeing to it, as you said, unanimously, uh, there is now a culture growing, unfortunately, currently in Congress ruled or Congress alliance ruled states where they're promising to go back. Why? Why now? Shumani, two broad things. One is I can understand the the frustration and compulsion of political parties, you know, world over, Hmm. fair, even in a country like the United States or in France, rich countries, anything given free or immediate short-term benefit to individuals, not really long-term good to the society. Immediate benefit gives you votes. Mm. They become popular. Loan waiver for the students in America or a lot of money to people's pockets in 
in America. They're very popular, except now they're paying the price, high inflation. Why is it happening? Because of that. Now interest rates are going up, economy is going into recession, you know, you're complaining about mm. things. France, they want to increase the retirement age precisely for this purpose. President Macron is arguing France has 62 years retirement, rest of Europe has 65 years. Mm. He's saying extend by another three years. That means pension level period is reduced. Mm. So overall pension burden comes down. The French people are opposing. He's lost a majority in parliament. So I can understand this in a democracy, but at least have a balance. Mm. I'm not saying you should not engage in welfare. The poor people require our support and welfare. But what is happening is the employees of the government constitute 1% of the population. Yeah. Maximum 1.5% of the population, actually 1% of the population. They really, in India, even the lowliest employee is bigger than 90% of the people of the country. In terms of security, in terms of a regular job, in terms of wage structure, in terms of other securities, influence, networking. Now, we are mortgaging the future of the balance 99% because we're worried about this 1%. You know, first pass the post system like ours, mm. you don't know where the winning votes are. Mm. You always fear, my God, I lose by another 100 votes, another 1,000 votes. So, they're not able to resist the pressure. And employees are very well organized, very vocal, very smart. Mm. For instance, all of Indian taxpayers must shout about this. Except you and I, why are not others shouting? Most people don't know. They think somebody else will do. People generally are not organized. Whereas employees are very effective in organizing. Trade unions, mm. collective, a thousand people gather, they fund it, they bamboozle the political parties. These are terrified employees because elections, polling booths, they manage the polling booths. So it mm. is an extreme form of playing to the galleries, completely disregarding the people's interests. These are these governments are hurting the people. I'm saying it openly and candidly. These governments are actually hurting the poor whose name they are seeking the votes. They are destroying the future of our children. And economic growth prospects we are talking about 7% now, I can guarantee you, you give it up. They become zero. Yeah, I think both of you are reiterating the same point. I have final minutes left. Uh, Mr. Nair, I want to understand from you, what is it that the government can do to make the NPS more attractive? Uh, for example, there was talk of increasing the annuitized portion of the NPS so that what you get from the remaining portion can be 45% of your last drawn salary. Is there something that needs to be done? Look, I think it's a fairly uh, good scheme and I, I don't favor tinkering with it. You know, uh, you know, pension is pension, right? It's not a, it's not, you, you can't get the same salary or close to the salary you're getting when you're working. When you're working, you're productive and you're pension, on pension, you're not. So I don't think that's the point. I think, you know, the fact that it's, uh, you, you can make it more aggressively market linked so that, you know, Perhaps, you know, the kitty itself can increase by, you know, uh, higher returns. Uh, but that, again, will cause problems because people want a guaranteed return rather mm. than, you know, playing with risk. But I don't favor any change to the NPS because, why, I mean, I mean, why should it be changed? I mean, I think it's a fairly generous system. As I, as I said earlier, most of the country uh, uh, it, and most of the world works on defined benefits that you pay some and your employer pays some and, mm. you know, you get it uh, at the end of the uh, of your working age. So I think we have to move towards global best practices, India best practices, and not go back to, uh, you know, system which is totally discredited. I mean, this is the kind of pension burden uh, which bankrupted countries like Greece and, you know, Portugal and uh, Italy and so on. And, you know, those countries lost significant amount of GDP because if the state overreaches hmm. and has to pay all these unproductive bills, hmm. at some point it, it's bound to collapse. It's not a sustainable system. So I think, uh, you know, rather than worrying about government employees i would like to change the narrative you know if if money has to be given hmm. and money has to be given for pensions uh, give it to people in the unorganized sector let the government uh, you know uh, give a pension to people working in unorganized sector people who poor as Mr. Nara, we have to look after them not government employees so True. change the narrative if, even if you're talking about uh, direct transfers or what are broadly freebies at least direct them and deserving uh, they also vote uh, they also need better lives. Mm. And in their case, you know, any extra amount uh, that's given to the poor, they'll spend it and boost the economy. Uh, and it'll be a much larger number of people. So I would face changing the narrative, okay. uh, you know, when this freebie debate, when we're talking about freebies, mm. give it to the deserving. You know, if you have to give it, and, you, and in all democracies, there are a certain amount of giveaways that are done, but give it at least to those who yeah. deserve it and give it to those who are likely to spend it productively. Don't I'm... give it to your elite. Don't give it to your 1%. 
uh, you know, at the cost of everybody else. So yes. I think and you know, along just with the this 1% freebie... and say improve NPS, I don't, I don't agree with that. Okay, fair enough. But along with the freebie issue, I think this is becoming a double whammy of sorts. If this continues to become a trend, final word to Mr. Narayan also, you are making a report on this, you tell, told me earlier. You will be meeting the finance minister, Niti Aayog, chief economic advisor and more concerned. What is your hope, sir? And do you believe that this recent clamor will go away, possibly with time, uh, and better financial prudence will settle in? It depends on you and me. Hmm. If the people of India don't understand, because so far, let's be truthful, people of India did not understand. They did not protest when West Bengal opted out of it. Hmm. They did not protest when Punjab opted for OPS. Hmm. They did not protest when Chhattisgarh, as you mentioned, Rajasthan, and uh, I think Jharkhand, they announced, I don't know what is the state, they have uh, moved back. Hmm. Because people thought it's not our problem. They never understood. It's our duty to come out with absolute numbers. Take it out of politics. Please, I beg of you. True. All of you. It's not about this party or that party. It is about our money. It's about our children's future. Our culture, our society, however poor we are, irrespective of caste, region, religion, our society is about protecting our children. Even the poorest person, if a 100 rupee income is there, we spend 90 and save 10 rupees. Hmm. The parents actually give up their wants and their desires for the, for the children. That's very interesting. Parents are willing to give, the, give up their lives for the children. In no other society you see that such family bonds. That is our culture. So what right do people who take our word, what right do they have to destroy our children's future because they want to please a small section for the time being hmm. at the humongous cost of tomorrow? This, if people understand this, then parties will go back. Mm. If you make it a BJP versus uh, opposition, Modi versus non Modi, Hindutva versus something else, that will be a disaster. It's not that, it's a fundamental issue. It's about the nation's future. Go to any country, see what's happening all over the world. This is a big issue across the world. And we have to stick to what already was done by OPG. We're grateful that he has done it. It's, a, it's an absurd thing that we're going back. True. Well, that is why I don't have politicians on this discussion today. I want our viewers to understand what is at stake. And I do thank both of you for joining us and outlining the perils and the dangers associated with this clamor.